the Electoral College. Every 4th November, after almost two years of campaign hype and money, over 90 million Americans vote for the presidential candidates. Then, in the middle of December, the President and the Vice President of the United States are actually elected by the votes of only 538 citizens. These 538 citizens are the electors of the Electoral College. So what is the Electoral College, how does it work, and why do we have it? First off, what is it? When you vote for a president and a vice president, you are actually telling the electors from your state who you want to win. In turn, they are supposed to add up your votes and cast their votes for the same candidate. The candidate who wins the popular vote in a state wins all of the votes for that state's electors. How does the Electoral College operate? Each state gets a number of electors that's equal to its number of members in the U.S. House of Representatives, plus one for each of its U.S. Senators. The number of representatives for each state is based on the population of a state, so a state with many millions of people may have many more representatives than a state with less than a million, such as Montana or Wyoming. Washington, D.C. gets three electors. While state laws determine how electors are chosen, they are generally selected by the political party committees within the states. Each elector gets one vote. Thus, a state with 11 electors would cast 11 votes. There are currently 538 electors, and the votes of a majority of them, 270 votes, are required to win the election. Should none of the candidates win 270 electoral votes, the 12th Amendment kicks in and the election is decided by the U.S. House of Representatives. The combined representatives of each state gets one vote and a simple majority of the states is required to win. This has only happened twice. Presidents Thomas Jefferson in 1801 and John Quincy Adams in 1825 were elected by the House of Representatives. While the state electors are pledged to vote for the candidate of the party that chooses them, nothing in the Constitution actually requires them to do so. This is rare though, and some states have laws prohibiting this from occurring. So on Tuesday, November 4th, we will all go to vote, and before the sun sets in California, at least one of the TV networks will have declared a winner. By midnight, one of the candidates will probably have claimed victory, and the others will have conceded. But the truth is, it isn't until the first Monday after the second Wednesday in December that the members of the Electoral College meet in their state capitals and cast their votes. Why the delay between the general election and the Electoral College meetings? Back in the 1800s, it simply took that long to count the popular votes and for all the electors to travel to the state capitals. The system hasn't changed due to tradition, and because now the time is more likely to be spent settling any disputes and for vote recounts. So why do we have the Electoral College? The Founding Fathers were actually afraid of a direct popular election. At the time, few citizens had formal educations. There were no political parties or structure on how to select candidates to run. In addition, travel was slow and communication was extremely limited, which meant that a very popular candidate in one region might be completely unknown in another. On the other hand, election by Congress would require the members to accurately assess the desires of the people of their states and actually vote accordingly. Framers worried that congressional members might vote according to their own agendas rather than the actual will of the people. As a compromise, we have the Electoral College system. So you might ask, is there a problem here? Critics of the Electoral College system, of which there are more than a few, point out that the system allows the possibility of a candidate actually losing the nationwide popular vote, but being elected president by the electoral vote. Can that happen? Yes, and it has. A look at the electoral votes from each state and a little math will tell you that the electoral college system makes it possible for a candidate to actually lose the nationwide popular vote, but be elected president by the electoral college. Has it ever happened? Has a presidential candidate ever lost the nationwide popular vote, but been elected president in the electoral college? Yes, three times. 
1876, there were a total of 369 electoral votes available, with 185 needed to win. Republican Rutherford B. Hayes, with 4,036,298 popular votes, won 185 electoral votes. His main opponent, Democrat Samuel J. Tilden, won the popular vote with 4,300,590 votes, but won only 184 electoral votes. Hayes was elected president. In 1888, there were a total of 401 electoral votes available, with 201 needed to win. Republican Benjamin Harrison, with 5,439,853 popular votes, won 233 electoral votes. His main opponent, Democrat Grover Cleveland, won the popular vote with 5,540,309 votes, but won only 168 electoral votes. Harrison was elected president. In 2000, there were a total of 538 electoral votes available with 270 needed to win. Republican George W. Bush with 50,456,002 popular votes won 271 electoral votes. His Democratic opponent, Al Gore, won the popular vote with 50,999,897 votes but won only 266 electoral votes. Bush was elected president. Most voters would be unhappy to see their candidate win the most votes but lose the election. Why would the Founding Fathers create a constitutional process that would allow this to happen? Considering that only three times in our history has a candidate lost the popular vote but been elected by the electoral vote, and that in all cases the popular vote was extremely close, the system has worked pretty well despite the constant criticism.